The Technology, watching The Sky at Night, now on BBC One with Patrick Moore. Good evening. I want to begin this program by saying a little about light. Now light, as I'm sure you know, is a wave motion and the distance between one crest and another is called the wavelength, just like waves in water. The whole range of wavelengths is called the electromagnetic spectrum and we only see a tiny part of it. We begin with the long wavelength radio waves, the infrared, then Visible light we can see from red to violet, and then ultraviolet, X-rays, and finally gamma rays. Now NASA has launched four great observatories to study the various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And joining me are three experts, Professor Jenny Gilmore, Professor Martin Barstow, and Dr. Chris Lintot. And the mayor first will come to you, Jay, and ask us to just what the great observatories are and what they're doing. And they're called the Great Observatories because when they all put, were put together, they give us a view of the universe which is so much more than we could have got from just one of them on its own. Starting with the, the extreme end, the extreme high energy end, the very, very hot sources and the relativistic sources produce gamma rays. And for that we have Compton, designed to map the sky for these extreme, extremely hot, extremely relativistic events. Essentially they're supermassive black holes. And this thing mapped the sky beautifully, it found loads and loads of them. The next of the great observatories coming down the energy scale was of course the Chandra X-ray Observatory, named after Chandra Sakhar, the great uh, theorist of uh, high energy universe. The x-rays are emitted by things that are maybe a million degrees temperature. You have to go to space to see these. Then we come down in temperature till you get to normal stars, a few thousand degrees. They of course shine in light, not by chance. Our eyes are adapted to see light. Uh, there you want to get above the atmosphere, not because the light doesn't come down. It does of course, we call it daylight. Uh, <coughs> but because the uh, atmosphere, our atmosphere blurs everything. And so here of course is the most famous one of all, the Hubble Space yeah, Telescope yeah. with its spectacular imaging, uh, which also actually works a little bit into the ultraviolet. Then coming down in temperature one gets into the infrared and that is heat radiation and the special mission that was designed to study uh, heat was called the Spitzer Space Observatory named after Spitzer, the guy who proposed the Hubble Observatory interestingly, closing the loop. And again that's been able to study deep into most of the universe that we couldn't see because most of the universe is buried behind dust clouds or it's very cold, so that's where you see new stars forming and that's where you look in behind the dust clouds and see what's really out there. Compton, sadly, is no longer there. That's right. Compton was the first to, to well, the only one so far that's reached the end of its life. It went up in 1991 and was deliberately deorbited, burnt up in the atmosphere in 2000. Spitzer has sort of come to the end of its life. It was launched in 2003 and then just earlier this year it ran out of coolant um, and that's critical for an infrared telescope. It's still doing science, it's doing uh, what they call the warm mission, um, but its main uh, purpose is now over. I'm fortunate, the, the two observatories that I'm most interested in using, Hubble and Chandra, are still operational. Chandra is just celebrating its 10th anniversary. It was launched uh, in the summer of 1999 and certainly going to be able to operate for another five or maybe even 10 years if we're lucky. The Hubble was launched in 1990 may well turn out to be the longest lived of all of them because it's recently been refurbished and repaired. Apart from putting on new instruments to help us in the visible and the infrared, for the first time in many years we will again have access to the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, which is something we can't get at all from the ground, so it's really crucial to have those instruments working. And you, Chris, what's your main interest? Well, I think the real joy of having all of these great instruments is when you put them together. And you can see this by looking at a, a single object. Yeah, Let's yeah. take, for example, an object in the autumn sky, the Crab Nebula, the Crab Nebula. M1, Messier 1. And in the optical, what you see is the hot gas, heated uh, by the remnant of an explosion that took place maybe a millennium ago now, and you see these, these beautiful tendrils of gas. Look in the infrared with Spitzer, and what we see are the parts of this object that have cooled 
Uh, you see the dust that perhaps was produced by the explosion, and you see a much wider nebula than you do in the optical. But the real excitement comes when you go to the high energy end of things. If you look in the gamma rays, you see a very bright point from the center. And then in the X-rays, you see this amazing structure around the remnant of the star itself. And you can even see things moving in the Chandra images. Chandra has revisited the crab over and over again. And you get this fantastic sense of material orbiting an exploded star. So when you take a nice image, for example, of our near neighbor galaxy, M31, another one that you can actually go and look at in your garden. Uh, when you take a lovely Hubble image, you see this amazing structure, you see all the star formation, you see how fascinating it really is. But then you take an X-ray picture of the same thing, and you discover all these other things that you can't see in the optical pictures at all. What are these other things? Well, they're black holes. They're black holes that are all little black holes that are orbiting around other stars and eating the other star. And it's the gas falling into these little black holes that you can see. And so we're discovering layers and layers of structure in the universe that you simply wouldn't have known were there unless you put all the observatories together and look across the big picture. What are the main surprises of TU, Martin? The, the main excitement of studying something like M31 is that we can look at the hot gas in the spaces between the stars. Sitting in our own Milky Way, we know that we're in a very complex environment, but because we're inside it, it's really hard to understand the structure of it and understand what's going on. By using an observatory like Chandra and essentially looking in from the outside, we can look at the hot gas, we can look at the supernova explosions that have happened in the past in M31, and we can see how they interact and create this fascinating bubble-like structure in interstellar space. And in fact, our own solar system is actually living inside such a bubble, but we can't really map it very easily. Looking at N31, we can see how these bubbles expand in space and then cross over each other and create the interstellar medium. And that's hugely important for the way material is spread around and new stars are formed and possibly even new life eventually. Well, M31 is very easy to see, but the totally is split not far from being edge on to us. And the, the next spiral, M33 in triangulum, that's face on. I love it, spiral. Yeah, so this is something else that's been viewed with all of the observatories. And I think in particular, if you look at a spiral galaxy, what you're seeing in the spiral arms, these beautiful blue in the Hubble images, uh, new stars. These are massive stars that formed maybe a hundred, couple of a hundred million years ago. So that's the, the blink of an eye to an astronomer. But if you look with the infrared with Spitzer at M33 or M81, a beautiful spiral in Ursa Major that's been studied a lot, what you see is the dust that traces out these spiral arms. And the dust, as we've mentioned before, is crucial for allowing star formation. Out in the, the wilds of intergalactic space, you've got all this radiation and this hot gas that Martin's been talking about. And that's exciting if you're an X-ray astronomer, but it's death if you're interested in star formation. What you need is to be able to keep your newly forming stars isolated. They need to be very cold to allow them to collapse. So to do that, we have this dust, particles smaller than sand grains, scattered through throughout the galaxies, and it's deep within these dusty clouds that the star formation happens. And we've seen that in places like the Tarantula Nebula, for example. Yeah, that's a particularly nice example, actually, because it's not an incredibly nice wallpaper. I mean, it's really cute. But there's an awful lot of physics going on in there. So you can see the star form, the debris from the star formation, the gas and the dust and the filaments and so on, just looking really decorative. Uh, and that's being boiled away by the hot young stars. You can see those hot young stars. They're the little blue guys that are also shining in the X-rays. And they're very hot. They're not going to be there for much longer. But if you look across to the side, you can see a bunch of older stars. And by looking at the colors of those older stars, we can measure their ages. For that, you have to look in the optical because it's only the optical colors, how blue they are, how red they are, how green they are, that tell you how old stars are. You can see this par excellence, not only in the beautiful tarantula nebula, young stars and old stars side by side, but in a rather cute picture looking through the heart of a very old star cluster, Omega Centauri. We can see now the real colors of those stars. You can see the red giants are red. You can see the, the blue stragglers, the younger age stars, and the horizontal branch stars, the nearly dying ones, are blue. And it's a bit harder to see, but the very faint blue things are the white dwarfs and the old dying stars. And so much of what Hubble is for now is to tell us how old the stars are. So when we look at even in these wonderful Hubble deep field images, we don't actually see lots and lots of stars forming. What we see is little faint blobs. What's really happening is those little faint blobs are millions and millions and millions of new stars forming buried deep in the sorts of 
dusty star forming regions just like those that of which we now can study close up with Spitzer and Hubble like these famous fingers of creation and so on where we can look in the optical and we see a few little stars we look in the infrared and we look inside those pillars and hey presto they're full of new stars little new planets little debris disks around them that are forming new planets Martin what's your favorite object my favorite object from the new Hubble images is the butterfly nebula it's a, a wide-field camera image taken in visible light that shows this enormous wind streaming away to create a, a new planetary nebula. It's travelling at about 600,000 miles an hour. That would mean that we would travel from here to the moon in about 24 minutes right. at that speed. And it's really showing the death throes of a star. You can't actually see the star itself because that's obscured by a band of dust. But you can see the wind flowing out from either pole. Your turn, Chris. I think I'll go for something on a slightly grander scale. There's a beautiful image uh, of Stefan's Quintet, oh, a yes. set of interacting galaxies. Actually, one of them's an interloper, but the rest of them are about 290 million light years away. And what you see is, I don't care about the galaxies particularly, but in between the galaxies, you could see material that's been drawn out uh, by the interactions. You see stars, we see star formation happening. There's a whole story in this one picture. I think uh, my favourite would have to be the much better quality gravitational lens image. This is the process by which gravity is bending light and is allowing us to see clear images of galaxies that are actually behind the cluster that's in, in front of it. It's particularly interesting in two ways. First, it tells us how to weigh things and reminds us that for all the beauty of the electromagnetic spectrum, there's this other thing out there called gravity, which is actually the most important thing of all. But also by just showing these arcs and curves in, in a fascinating way, it not only allows us to weigh stuff, which is the dark matter in the universe, but it almost visualizes it. These arcs are almost a way of seeing gravity in action. Well, all these space observers have been triumphs for everybody. They've done an amazing job. Chris, Martin, Jerry, thank you very much. We've talked about the Crab Nebula, Triangle Spiral, the Andromeda Galaxy. Let's now go and join Pete Lawrence in the garden. The wonderful thing about the night sky is that it's available to everybody and a lot of the objects which are being observed by the great observatories are also visible to amateur astronomers. Now we can find a number of these in the October night sky quite easily. So let's start with one of the most exotic, which is M1, the Crab Nebula. But before going on, I'd better explain what the M1 bit means. This is actually a reference to the fact that the Crab Nebula is the first entry in a very famous catalogue known as the Messier Catalogue. The M stands for Messier. This was a catalogue which was put together by a famous French astronomer, Charles Messier, in the 18th century. He was a famous comet hunter, but he was fed up with tripping over deep sky objects. They looked just like comets. So what he did was he compiled a catalogue of deep sky objects so he wouldn't keep tripping over them and discovering them as comets. And it's rather ironic that no one really remembers the comets which Charles Messier has discovered, but they all remember the things he didn't want to find. OK, so to locate M1, if you go out towards midnight, look towards the east, you'll see another entry in Charles Messier's catalogue, M45, the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. This is a tight little star cluster which twinkles away and grabs your attention. If you go directly down from the Pleiades, you find a bright orange star which is known as Aldebaran, that's the brightest star in Taurus the Bull. And this too sits in another cluster known as the Hyades, a V-shaped cluster, with the V being on its side. If you extend the arms of the V to the left or to the east, you'll come to two stars which mark the tips of the bull's horns. The lower one, known as Zeta Tauri, is the key to finding the crab, because if you look about two full moon widths, that's about a degree, up and slightly to the right of that position, that's where the crab nebula sits. Now another famous Messier object visible in the October sky is M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. It lies in the constellation of Andromeda, the Chained Princess, and to locate it we can use a neighbouring constellation known as Cassiopeia, the Seated Queen. Now you may know Cassiopeia under the more familiar name as the W, and this is very high up this time of year. And if you identify the right hand half of it and think of it as an arrowhead, Follow the direction the arrowhead is pointing down for about the same distance as the width of the W. And here you'll find M31. 
if you've got reasonably dark skies, you should be able to see the galaxy as a faint elongated misty patch. Now what you're looking at here is actually the core of M31, the very bright inner part of it. But if we show you a long exposure photograph, then you can see the true beauty of the galaxy. Now those spiral arms which surround the core are invisible to the naked eye, but a camera can pick them up quite easily. There are over 100 entries in the entire Messier catalogue which can be seen throughout the year. So go out and enjoy them. Pete, thank you very much. Well, because for our news notes, I think we've got to begin with these magnificent pictures of the Saturnian system sent back by Cassini. And the one I like particularly is Saturn's satellite Enceladus, one part illuminated by sunlight and the other part by Saturn light. Yes, it's stunning, isn't it? You see this effect on Earth, of course, when you have a crescent moon and you can see the rest of the moon faintly shining because of light reflected off the Earth. Well, that's what we've got here, except it's light reflected off Saturn. It's, it's a beautiful image. Another picture I like particularly is one of Saturn's tiny moon Daphnis, which moves around Saturn inside the Keeler Gap in the outer bright ring, ring A, only five miles across, and we can see its shadow on the ring. Yes, the rings, of course, aren't solid. They're made up of uh, almost countless numbers of icy particles ranging up from tiny things up to a few hundred metres across. And Daphnis and the other moons pull these about as they go. That's why you get these gaps in the ring system. But what we can see now with the amazing images from Cassini is the small scale effects that these moons have. Look here, for example, you can see there's a part of the ring on the edge of the gap there where the material's been pulled up by about four kilometres above walked, the ring. It's been and distorted, yeah. Precisely, but only by a few kilometres. And yet we can see it because the the light angle is just right. And better than that, we can look at the shadow that this feature causes, measure the size of the shadow, and that gives us the height of these features. So people who study the dynamics of the rings, who try and understand um, how disks like this behave, uh, are having a field day with Cassini, and they're wonderful images. But now, something much more sensational. Uh, reports of water on the moon. One might imagine that there are pools of liquid water there. Uh, we're talking about the Indian satellite Chandrayaan-1, co confirmed by looking at old data from Cassini, the probe that passed by the moon on the way to Saturn, and Deep Impact on its way to its next rendezvous with a comet. And as you say, the results show clear signs of water in the top few millimetres of the lunar soil, um, but not in huge concentrations. We're talking, if you took a washing machine's worth of this material, a cubic metre, and you squeezed it to get all the water out, you'd get maybe a litre, one and three quarter pints, so, right. so not a huge amount of water. I wonder. Certainly no usable amounts. Well, not over the whole lunar surface. The idea that you could just dig down wherever you happen to land and have enough water to drink or even to convert to rocket fuel is, is pushing it a bit. But the question is, are the, does this water concentrate anywhere on the lunar surface? Well, there are experiments going on to try and find out what may happen below. As we know, um, we're going to send a probe and crash it into the crater Cabeus Examine the debris thrown up and see whether there are any traces of watery material there. Yes, I mean, this is the mission of Alcross, which will hit the moon on October the 9th, as you know, Patrick. Um, and Alcross was planned in response to some quite different measurements, radar measurements from the ground, data from Clementine and Lunar Prospector that suggest there might might be large deposits of water at the bottom of these craters near the South Pole which never see the sun. So how do these new results affect it? Well, if this water can move about the surface, and there are certainly signs that it evaporates and recondenses over the course of lunar days, then maybe that will build up these concentrations at the South Pole. So I would say that Elcross now has a pretty good chance of finding water, but I, I know you disagree. I'm highly sceptical and I don't think we're ever going to go peddling in the Mare Chrysium. No, that's true. It would be fun though, wouldn't it? It, it look, would looks like fun. an ideal swimming pool. It would be great fun. Well. By next month, we should know more. Well, we'll see. Chris, thank you very much. Don't forget, it's newsletter time. If you want your newsletter, send your stamped addressed envelope to newsletter 115, BBC at the Sky at Night. The mailbox, Birmingham, B11AY. And so, until next month, good night. <laughs>